go, I'll go. Where you stay, I'll stay. When you move, I'll move. I will follow. All your ways are good. All your ways are sure. I will trust in you alone. Romans 5, 6 through 10. For while we were still weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more, now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. For I spoke a word, you were singing over me. been so, so good to me. For I took a breath, you breathed your life in me. You have been so, so kind to me. Down, fights till I'm found 
leaves the 99 and I couldn't earn it and I don't deserve it still you give yourself away and oh the overwhelming never ending reckless love of God yeah your flow, still your love fought for me. You have been so, so good to me. I felt no worth, you paid it all. been so, so kind to me. Oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God. Oh, it chases me down, fights till I'm found, leaves the 99. But I couldn't earn it, and I don't deserve it. Still you give yourself away Oh, the overwhelming, never-ending Reckless love of God yeah. Yeah. Laid 
all down For the sake of you, my King Giving you my dreams Laying down my rights Giving up my pride For the promise of new life And I surrender all to you, all to you. And I surrender all to you, all. Singing you this song, waiting at the cross, and all the world holds dear, count it all as lost, for the sake of knowing you, the glory of your name, to know the lasting joy, even sharing it. And I Good morning, church. It's good to be with you again this morning. Again, thank you to the praise team for setting the table for us this morning as we dive in to the word together. Last week, we started our journey into chapter three as we looked at the first three verses of chapter three and Paul reminding us to rejoice in the Lord, but also to be on guard for the evildoers and and the dogs that would bring about the false teachings. And today, we're going to finish up our time together in chapter three. So we're gonna look at a big chunk of chapter three together. But the thing that I want us to focus on together, I want us to focus on this idea that I brought up last week at the very end of our time together, and that is that Christ is to be our divine obsession. And when he becomes our divine obsession, when we rejoice in him, the circumstances and the trials and tribulations of life, we don't focus on those as much. We don't get caught up in those things. 
And so today, as we look at verses 4 through 21, that's going to be the focus of our time together. And here's the thing. When you stop and really think about it, man has this innate sense that they have a need or a relationship with God. All right? And there, there is something that they need. And so they have this stirring of these feelings for a need of a relationship with God. And so because of that, they have this desire to be accepted. And so what happens is, is that they, they, you have all these different religions that have been started because of this need that they have. Even though they may not admit it, they have this desire for it. And so what happens is, is that they have this desire to please their God. And so they build these different religions that are based off of things like works or doing good or securing favor or making themselves or oneself acceptable. So therefore, you now have this religion of self-righteousness, becoming as righteous as one can be, earning merit or earning favor before their God working their way into his presence. And if you remember, last week, I talked about the fact that there are prominent pastors that are starting to argue that Christ may not be the only way to God. This idea of false teachings that are coming in more and more into play in today's society. But we know that this is not possible. We know that that you cannot do enough. There's not enough merit that you can gain to get access into God. There's only one way, and that is through Jesus Christ, our Lord. So we're going to look at today, as we start in verse 4, we're going to look at the beginning of how Paul started and then how his conversion experience really changed his entire walk. So before we jump into these verses, I want to lead us in a word of prayer, all right? So let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning, Lord, we thank you. We thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your grace, for your mercy. Father, I thank you for the honor, the privilege to be in this place today, to be standing here to be your messenger. God, I thank you for the praise team and for them leading us before the throne to set the table for our time together in your word. God, I pray that as as always, God, that minds would be open, that hearts would be pierced with the truth of your word. And Father, if there's someone listening today that doesn't know you, that today would be the day that changes their life forever. Father, we love you. It's in your name. Amen. So we're going to start off. I'm going to read this passage, this the, these verses together. And follow along, if you've got your Bible or your app or your tablet or whatever, follow along, or you can follow along on the screen with the slides. But looking at verse four, it says this, or starting there. Though I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh, also if anyone else thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews as to the law of Pharisee, as to zeal, a per- persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. But whatso- whatsoever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ, Jesus my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already obtained this or am already perfect, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Let those of us who are mature think this way, and if in anything you think otherwise, God will reveal that also to you. Only let us hold true to what we have obtained. 
Brothers, join in imitating me and keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example you have in us. For many of whom I have often told you and now tell you, even with, their, with tears, walk as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their end is destruction, their God is their belly, and their glory is in their shame. With minds set on earthly things, but our citizenship is in heaven. And from it, we await a savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body by the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself. Now, I know that's a big chunk of scripture and there's a lot there and we're gonna break it down in pieces. So we're gonna start with verses four through six. And this is where Paul had achieved the height. This is the first one thing I wanna look at, the height of self-righteousness, okay? He tells us in verse four that if there's anyone that had worked or achieved everything you could possibly achieve to be able to get into heaven, it's him, okay? He had, basically, he had earned and done enough to earn God's approval. He had inherited a lot of this stuff too as well, and he breaks it down into two sections, privileges of birth and achievements of self-worth effort. So he says there in the privileges of birth, he says he was circumcised on the eighth day. This was a rite of birth. This was a true uh, thing for a Jewish believer. He was of the people of Israel, which was the right heritage, and he was also of the tribe of Benjamin. But then he has here where he breaks it down that the achievements of self-effort, that he was a Hebrew of the Hebrews, that he was a Pharisee, that he had zeal, that he was faultless. Listen, if you were to take all these things, Paul, before his conversion, would have been seen as a spiritual superman. But like we talked about last week, these are nothing more than a false circumcision. These are nothing more than a sign, okay? And that's all they were meant to be. These are not things that are gonna further a relationship with God. They're not going to further a relationship with Christ. And Paul here is trying to tell us in these two verses, he's basically trying to say that, listen, this birth, these religious rituals, they're not, they, they can't rub off on you. They don't, they don't make you any more prominent in the eyes of God. The ancestors, the status, this, these don't help. And this religious faithfulness, that a lot of times that people in today's society tend to think is gonna get them into a presence of God. If they simply come to church or they hang out with family members that are Christ-like or know God, or they follow a religion, that's gonna be good enough. These things don't rub off. That's not what gets you into the presence of Christ and the presence of God. It's knowing Christ, having a relationship with him. Matthew 7, 22 and 23 says this, on that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name, cast out demons in your name, do many mighty works in your name? And then when I, I will declare to them, I never knew you, depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. And then in Romans 10, 3, it also says, for being ignorant of the righteousness of God and seeking to establish their own, they did not submit to God's righteousness. So then moving on to the next few verses in 7 through 11, Paul points us in another direction. Okay, so this is the direction that Paul points us. That's the next point I want us to see, an example, the way that we should go. We see a 100% reversal in Paul's thought process, all right, that he sought to win Christ. He sought to win this righteousness, to seek this righteousness of God. This was the major thing that Paul was after. He had had a major experience with Christ on the road to Damascus. He had, at, at before that, he had counted his own righteousness above all. That was the most important thing. But that encounter with Christ, it changed everything. The same can be said for us. Have, have we had an encounter with Christ that has changed everything? He continued to strive for perfection. But he knew that he had so much more to attain. And see, Paul, he he had not committed himself, had he not committed himself totally to Christ, 
God would have known his faith and he would have known that it wasn't genuine. And God would not have used him. You know, see, God sees our faith and he knows whether or not it's genuine. Genuine faith takes a total commitment to Jesus Christ. We have to give everything to him. We can't hold on to a little piece and say, well, God, I'm gonna hold on to that. I'm gonna keep that for myself and you can have everything else. It doesn't work that way. We gotta give it all to him. So then Paul continues on and he reminds us of the experience of Christ, that he, is, he counts all things as loss in order to gain him. In Luke 14, 33, so therefore any one of you who does not renounce all that he has cannot be my disciples. Listen, you don't go, you don't choose Christ, you don't find salvation in Christ and then go on living the way that you were living. Again, it doesn't work that way. It's making a decision and then you turn from your old way of life and live a new life found in Christ. Think of it this way. It's like a checkbook illustration and Paul, there are theologians that have used this. I really like this, but think of it this way. Paul uses the language of gain and loss. All of Paul's accomplishments were personal credits. And he even, he even alludes to this. But in one move, they became one big debit. He saw them as personal pluses. But now his only credit was Christ. He had no regrets with this. And he realized what his goal now was. And he continues on in this this part of the passage that he sought a personal future experience with Christ. It was either gonna be death or it was gonna be Christ's return, but regardless, he wanted to be found in him. Titus 3, 5. He saved us, not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit. Paul also sought this victorious experience in Christ. He sought to know him, that he might be known. To know Christ is to share in his sufferings. Here's the thing. A lot of times we want to know him. We want to know Christ. We want to know all about him. But when it comes to the actual sufferings of Christ, we don't want to know or take part in the sufferings of Christ. We might want to know about the sufferings of Christ, but we don't want to take part in them with him because that, that's, that's too hard. But the thing is, Paul is saying here, he wanted to share in those sufferings. He wanted to not only have the fellowship with Christ, but he also wanted to share in the sufferings of Christ. It's important to understand that God draws near to those who suffer for the cause of Jesus. He gives them a special sense of his presence. Paul also sought to put his flesh and desires to death so that he could do the will of God. He sought to deny himself and to take up his cross daily. He sought to crucify the old person that, that was. He, he sought to commit himself as dead to sin, but alive in Christ. He wanted that personal experience with Jesus. Romans 6, 11, so you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Listen, as believers, we are called to do the same. We have to understand the power of Jesus Christ. We have to understand the sufferings that he endured to be glorified with him. Thus, we have to take up our cross as part of knowing the master. So then you go on to verses 12 through 16. And in this section, I look at it as that Paul is basically saying, not there yet. That's what he's telling us. I'm not there yet yet. He hadn't attained perfection. 
You know, the perfection is the great end of the believer. We're not gonna attain it in this lifetime. Hopefully we, we, we grasp that. Hopefully you understand that. Yet some, sometimes we, we have this tendency to be narrow-minded enough that if we ever grasp what perfection would really mean, I mean, look at it this way. The human brain, we only use one-tenth of the human brain, the mental capacity that the brain is capable of. I mean, what would perfection look like? What if we never desired thought or did wrong? What if we never came up short? What if we never aged? What if we never decayed? I mean, think about it this way. Paul says this in Romans 7, 18 and 19. For I know that nothing good dwells in me, that is, in my flesh. For I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I keep on doing. So in other words, I want to do good, but I don't. I don't want to do bad, but I do. (laughs) So that's an easy way to put it. Paul is showing a picture here. He, He hadn't obtained it. And this is Paul, by far one of the greatest men, one of the greatest biblical men that ever walked the face of the earth. He followed after the God-given purpose that he had been given. He wanted to work towards perfection. And the question that Paul, in my opinion, in this writing poses for us is, is that what we want to do ourselves. Do we want to seek after perfection? Do we want to seek after his righteousness? Do we want Christ to become our divine obsession? Is that what we want daily? I mean, we talked about this two weeks ago when we talked about the fact that Paul calls us to work out our salvation with fear and trembling, but without grumbling and basically fighting. When we do these things, it it benefits us individually, but it also benefits the body from a unity standpoint. But when we just sit on the gift of salvation that we've been given, it's not working out our faith. It's not benefiting anyone. It's becoming lazy and complacent. It's not benefiting the church at all. And it's definitely not striving toward perfection. The reality is this, the more we come to know Christ, the more we come to know the sense of him and the more we desire to grow. Paul tells us to forget what's behind and strive toward this perfection. We don't need to focus on the shortcomings. We don't need to focus on the failures. And listen, I understand this is hard. This is hard. It's hard to not focus on shortcomings. It's hard to focus, not to focus on failures. Listen, I was even talking about this with Pastor David this morning. It's hard not to focus on shortcomings. Trust me, as pastors, we have shortcomings. But we have to focus on the goal. We have to focus on perfection. We have to concentrate on what God has in store for us. That's why Paul says, but the one thing I do, Paul's focusing. We have to focus on what his purpose is for us, to be conformed in the image of Christ. Paul kept his mind on perfection. That's what his goal was. And I get it, it's, it's difficult to do. It's, it's difficult in a world that's gripped with ease and comfort. It's, the world is gripped with pleasure and, and plenty. It's, it's gripped with recognition and, and possession. But again, Paul says, but the one thing I do, it's a reference of the past and the future and the present. But it's a picture of absolute focus and intensity. He was emphasizing the growth 
that is supposed to occur in you and in me. First John 1, 7 says, but if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. So then you get to the, the last portion of this, this chapter that we're looking at today, verses 17 through 21. And this is really the reminder of what it looks like to be a true example, okay? The call that Paul puts on us to be a godly example You and I are called to be imitators. That's exactly what we're called. Think about it. Babies learn by watching others. Others see and learn by watching you and by watching me. We set an example for the world, for our family and for our friends, do we not? If you remember, even last week and the week before, we talked about modeling the gospel. That's what we're called to do, to model the gospel. People watch us whether we realize it or not. If we do well, if we strive towards it, people will be encouraged to do the same. But the problem is in a world that we live in like today, when we fail, they look at us and go, oh, well, they're no different than we are. Folks, we're human. We're gonna mess up. We we need forgiveness. But the bottom line is, is we've gotta do our best to model the gospel in everything that we do. We set a pattern for others to follow. Paul is one of the godliest examples that's in scripture. And he's not claiming to be perfect. He says it right here. He says, I have not attained it yet and we're not going to attain it in this lifetime. The Greek word translated, for example, is tupos, and it means to leave an imprint or a mark. And we we seek Christ with such and with diligence that our example will be marked on those around us. Again, modeling the gospel. No one can claim perfection except one man, and that's the man that we seek. We seek to follow his example. 1 Corinthians 4, 16. Therefore, I urge you to imitate me. Paul encourages us to live godly lives, to live godly examples, because we're always seeing enemies around us. Paul talks about the term enemy here, those that reject Christ, those that reject his death on the cross, and they want to stamp out his sacrifice those who are more focused on the world and what it offers. Folks, we live in a world that the people need to see Jesus in what we say and in what we do, how we act and the way we carry ourselves. They need to see him living in us. The basis of our lives needs to be Christ and the sacrifice that he made on our behalf on the cross. And then you get to the last part where he, he reminds us of the joy that we've talked about in this chapter thus far, to rejoice in the Lord, to remember that joy, that we have a citizenship in heaven. As believers, you have that citizenship. And the Philippian church knew where their citizenship lied, And they were doing everything they could to live out their example in the midst of where they were on earth in that Roman colony. And they they continued to decide to stand firm. They continued to live out their citizenship. They had an ultimate confession in Christ. Ephesians 2, 19 So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. Listen, as believers, we're eager for that day when we will be united with Christ. When we, you know, we await his coming. 
That's really what it, what it is. And Paul is saying here, again, that he's not only setting the example for us as Christians, but he's also pointing toward the example of Christ and how we should live. I found it stated this way. I found it wrote, it said this, Paul's longing set the example for the church. If you have any of the same desire, make this your prayer. I want to know you, Lord, to really know you. Would you pray with me? Father, we come to you today, Lord, we thank you. We thank you for your blessings. We thank you for your mercy. God, I thank you so much for believers such as Paul, one of the greatest examples in scripture that we have to follow. Thank you, God, for his writings, for what he shared with us, God, for the example that he set and showed us that what we are to strive toward. Father, I pray today that if there is someone that is listening to this message, to your word, God, that if they have never understood what it means to know you, if they have never understood what it means to truly follow the example of Jesus Christ, that God, today would be that day. But Lord, if maybe there's a believer that's listening today that maybe hasn't been following that example, God, they haven't been modeling the, the gospel like they should be. Father, all you have to do is simply just turn around and, and you're right there waiting with open arms. So Lord, today I pray that today could day be the day of salvation for some and can, today could be the day to get back on the right track for others. And even for others, today could be a day of simply reinforcing what we're called to do and who we're called to be. Jesus, we love you. It's in your name. Amen. Church, it's been a blessing to be with you today, and I pray that as we end our time together, that you would strive to make Christ your divine obsession, that you would rejoice in him so that the trials and tribulations of life would not be a distraction for you. God bless you, church. We'll see you next week. We are one in the Spirit. We are one in the Lord. We are one in the Spirit. We are one in the Lord. And we pray that our unity will one day be restored. And they'll know we are Christians by our love, by our love. Yes, they'll know we are Christians by our love. We will walk with each other. We will walk hand in hand. We will walk with each other. We will walk hand in hand. And together we'll spread the news that